Good morning and welcome everyone to the second EPS Peptide Highlight Symposium on peptide-based approaches to fight crop diseases. It's great to see so many of you online and we're looking forward to a fantastic lineup of speakers. My name is Ruben Ruck and I'm the, in my main affiliation, the Editor-in-Chief of Chem Biochem, but I'm also the Wiley representative for the Journal of Peptide Science, which belongs to the European Peptide Society. This, the, today's event is brought to you by the European Peptide Society and with me today is Norbert Seba, the current president of the European Peptide Society and also Paolo Rivero, the new editor-in-chief of EPS's uh, uh, journal, the Journal of Peptide Science. And also, of course, our two plus one speakers, I'm gonna tell you about this in a second, Stefano Rosa, Emilio Montesinos, and Volker Herzig. Volker is affected by the heavy rains and flood in Australia. So he will, will show you a recording of his presentation and he will try to log on for questions and answers. And last but not least, Katja, who is the organizer and moderator of today's event. And we are very, very thankful, Katja, to you for getting this together. Um, before I hand over to uh, Norbert to say a few words, just a few technical details, um, the, with the first presentation will be from Volker, then Stefano, and last but not least, Emilio. If you have any questions, please address them in the Q&A function. And I will then afterwards forward those questions to the speakers. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Right, and with that, Norbert, I'm happy to hand over to you to say a few words um, from the EPS. Yes, thank you very much, Ruben. Um, uh, good morning to everybody. So uh, as the president of the European Peptide Society, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to uh, this online event. In these strange times, uh, now we are in the third year, basically, of, of the pandemic. Uh, we are sort of used to uh, online conferences, although I'm convinced that they cannot fully replace uh, meetings in presence because uh, meeting people in person is really a very nice thing. So we are confident and uh, full of hope that we will be able to um, meet uh, at the European Peptide Symposium in uh, late August and the be beginning of September this year. Um, but today, we, as I mentioned, uh, we have gathered to uh, this uh, online meeting, to this virtual conference, and I'm very grateful to uh, Katja Teixeira uh, to um, have organized this uh, wonderful meeting and brought together the speakers for this meeting. I think it's a, a very timely subject, but it's also a subject which is uh, usually not considered to be in the in the focus of peptide science, but uh, I think uh, there is very much promise uh, in the application of, of peptide uh, in fighting crop diseases. So I'm very curious uh, about uh, what will uh, be presented uh, today. Uh, thank you all for being prepared uh, to act as a speaker here in, in this in this meeting. And I also want to, of course, uh, say hello to, to Ruben. Thank you very much for being open for all the initiatives of the EPS and also to Paolo, um, who is prepared to, to attend this meeting. And uh, I think uh, this will be also, uh, or the, the Journal of Peptide Science might be a, a podium um, for uh, this type of research in, in the near future. So thank you very much again, and I'm really looking forward to all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norbert. And then let's quickly hand over to Paolo, uh, because as some of you might know, and some might not, he's the new editor-in-chief of the Journal of Peptide Science, and we're looking forward to hear a few words from him. Thank you, Ruben. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon if you are in a different uh, time zone. Uh, as mentioned, my name uh, is Paolo Rovero. I'm connected from the University of Florence, Italy. And since last January, I'm the new uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Peptide Science. I, I have to mention, I want to mention that last year, the uh, um, journal was planning to appoint as uh, editor-in-chief uh, our colleague and friend uh, uh, at the time, uh, uh, deputy editor of the journal, deputy uh, editor in chief of the journal, Professor Ulf Didriksen. 
Uh, unfortunately, as probably most of you already know, um, Ulf Professor Didriksen uh, suddenly and prematurely passed away uh, last November. Uh, I would like to remember with gratitude uh, uh, the, the fundamental contribution uh, given by Ulf uh, to the uh, field of peptide science in general and to our journal in particular, as uh, he served for many years under the direction of Professor Louis Moroder as uh, uh, deputy editor in chief. Uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, coming to this event, uh, I would like to, to, to thank the European Peptide Society and our president, uh, Professor Sebald, for uh, organizing this series of virtual symposia. As mentioned by um, Norbert, this, in this crazy period of pandemic, the virtual symposia had played a, an important role uh, to, to keep our community in contact. Uh, hopefully, we are moving, we are stepping out from, from the pandemic, and we will open, hopefully soon have the opportunity to meet in person again. But maybe uh, the uh, uh, virtual mode could remain as an opportunity to uh, stay in touch and to spread, uh, to, to spread science and to uh, connect each other. Uh, I, while we are uh, optimistic about uh, uh, the new normal toward which hopefully we are moving, uh, we, we, we cannot forget the horrible news that we receive from Ukraine. I, I, I strongly believe that science uh, uh, should operate uh, for, for the wellness of mankind, uh, being based on uh, peaceful collaboration among scientists uh, across borders and across nations. And so we could not be insensible or transparent to these uh, in front of these uh, events. Uh, accordingly, I, I, I do believe that uh, our community should strongly condemn the violent invasion of Ukraine and stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Uh, as clearly stated, among other recently by, by the, 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 the European Chemical uh, Society. Uh, finally, um, I would like to, to, to thank uh, Katia for, uh, for the very nice uh, uh, choice and, and original choice of, of the subject of this event, as mentioned also by, by Norbert. Uh, it's uh, probably something not as known as it should be, and so it's a good opportunity to uh, uh, see this aspect, uh, one of the many aspects of the, of the field of peptide science. Uh, the Journal of Peptide Science is uh, open to any subject concerning peptides, so please consider also uh, in this field, in this specific part of the, of the peptide science, to submit your contribution to the Journal of Peptide Science. Thank you very much, and I give the word to Katia. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Katia Teixeira, researcher from the Peptide Science Group of the Faculty of Science of the University of Porto, where I have been working on peptide-based biopesticides for crop prote protection. And so I hope you'll enjoy this uh, specific topic as much uh, as I do. Well, it's a real pleasure to commemorate the second edition of the EPS Peptide Highlights, and uh, I would like to briefly thank the European Peptide Society and its Journal um, of Peptide Science uh, for hosting this event, Wiley, of course, for uh, all the technical support, uh, and uh, finally, a, spe a special uh, uh, thank to the speaker for accepting the invitation uh, to share their work, and last, last but not least, uh, all, the, all of you that have joined us uh, in that uh, exciting event. So I will uh, briefly move to the kick of, uh, of this meeting and move forward for our first speaker. And as our Ruben told, unfortunately Volker uh, will not be able to be present uh, today because of the massive floods, uh, floods uh, that are happening in uh, Southeast Queensland. Uh, but he somehow managed to send us a recorder, uh, recorded presentation. So Volker Herzig is an uh, associate professor at South East Queensland University and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow whose work is focused on the biodiscovery of novel and safe biopesticides from spiders and scorpion venom peptides. Um, so let's hear 
what spiders can do for us besides scaring some of us to death. Hello, I'm Associate Professor Volker Hersig and I'm an ARC Future Fellow at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Today, I'm going to tell you about our search for arachnid venom derived peptides as environmentally friendly bioinsecticides. Unfortunately, you have to watch the talk um, in the recorded version as I'm unable to give a live talk as our internet stopped working three days ago and we had massive flooding here. So our property got half a meter of water in just three days and other properties in the in the region got even up to one and a half meters and there's a lot of road closures and I'm unable to make it to university and yeah, my home internet is not working. So this is why you have to watch my recorded version. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so why do we need new insecticides? First of all, insects cause a massive destruction of our um, crops. So between 10 and 20% of crops worldwide are destroyed by insect pests. And, then, and that's just the crops on the field. So there's another 10 to 20% of crops that get destroyed in storage. Besides the, um, the damage that these insects cause on, on our food supply, there's lots of insects that transmit diseases to humans, um, in particular mosquitoes. And just malaria alone um, causes more than, or almost half a million deaths per year worldwide. And there's a lot of other diseases which are transmitted by, <coughs> by insects. And to control all of these pest insects and the disease transmitting insects, we need insecticides. And a problem that's um, making the situation of the first two points even worse is that we have an increasing global population, which means there are more people that need to be fed and also more people potentially in danger of disease transmitting um, insects. And another big problem is that of our current insecticides, um, many of them target only a handful of uh, molecular targets. And there's a lot of resistance and cross resistance that has already developed. So there's more than 500 insect species that have already become resistant to one or several of the insecticides. Now, there's also environmental concerns. Um, so some of the insecticides cause unwanted effects on uh, non-target animals. So best and most recent example are the neonicotinoids, which cause unwanted side effects on honeybees, um, which are important for um, pollination of a lot of um, our um, plants. And um, obviously we want to avoid that. So and um, in order to get rid of all of these problems, we need new insecticides that are environmentally friendly. And where do we find these new insecticides? Um, so a lot of the inspiration comes from um, nature. So some of the existing insecticides are already um, derived from natural organisms. So we have components from plants like pyrethroids or imidacloprid, or from bacteria like the, the Bt toxin which is widely used, and also from fungi like Spinoza and Avermectin. Now, in my group, we are actually looking to find novel bioinsecticides from arachnid venom, so spider and scorpion venom. So today I focus uh, my talk mainly on the spider toxins, and I'll show you some examples from our research. Um, so why do we think spider venoms are a good source for novel bioinsecticides? First of all, there are lots of spiders, so they're extremely diverse. So there's more than 50,000 described species. And there's an estimate that their combined diversity of venom compounds is more than 10 million peptide toxins. 70% of the, these components are estimated to be insecticidal. So there's there's millions of insecticidal components um, that can be found in spider venoms. And you can see these venoms actually um, give the spiders an um, evolutionary advantage over their insect prey. So you can see this spider here 
overcame a prey that is much bigger than itself, or even that one here was the butterfly. Or some of them can overcome prey that's also potentially preying on spiders, like this praying mantis that's eaten by a jumping spider. And other spiders use their venom to overcome prey that's venomous themselves, like hymenopterans or wasps, bumblebees, or, or ants. Now, what is the composition of a spider venom? Um, so it's incredibly diverse. So obviously, it's all dissolved in water, and we have some um, inorganic salts, but it's mainly small um, organic compounds. And then we have like some polyamines, neurotransmitters, and especially peptides are a major component of spider venoms, but also some larger um, proteins or enzymes. Now, just the terminology. Um, so the term venom is used if such a complex um, cocktail of substances is actively injected or distributed into an organism. So for example, the spiders, uh, they use fangs or the snakes, they have fangs to inject their venom into prey. Scorpions use a stinger or cone snails, um, they use harpoons. Whereas the term poison is also used for a complex mixture that's distributed to an organism, but in this case it's passive distribution. So in case of amphibians like frogs or toads, um, they have venom glands, but they can't inject their venom. So, but in case they are swallowed by a predator, then they deliver their um, this mixture. And in this case, it's called um, a poison. So it's the same for plants and, and fungi. Um, and the term toxin is basically one individual component. So it can be one polyamine, one peptide, one protein, which causes um, an adverse effect in a, particularly, in a particular victim. Now, how do we tackle this complexity if we search for novel bioinsecticides? So usually first step, we screen a number of different venoms against our particular target insect species. And then the venoms that show the most promising effects, we start um, a fractionation process using high pressure liquid chromatography. So usually in the first step, we use a C18 reverse phase column and run the crude venoms through. And usually that gives us between 50 and 100 different peaks, which we all collect individually. You can see here, for example, this red peak, fraction 23, um, showed insecticidal effects. And now, when we run this fraction through a different type of column, in this case, it was an ion exchange column, we actually f can find very often that another 10 to 20 subfractions result from each of these fractions. So overall, we might end up with up to a thousand different fractions or, or peptide toxins per venom. And it can be even more complex. So if you look at um, this example, so that's the venom from a Australian funnel web spider. And that's a paper we published um, last year. And we actually used two different methods of mass spectrometry, the Orbitrap and MALDI. And combined total, we found more than 3,000 peptide toxins in this venom. So it's incredibly di diverse, the, the complexity of venom peptides. Now, despite this complexity and the fact that I told you um, a lot of these spider toxins are insecticidal, um, there was actually an influential person in the field, Wolfgang Nandwig, and in 93, uh, he wrote a letter to the editor of Toxicon, where he claimed that spider venoms are not suitable insecticides. Now, what were the, was the reasoning behind his arguments? Um, so, first of all, Wolfgang said um, spiders are generalist predators, so they're not particularly specialized on any pest species. They basically eat any insect that they can overwhelm. Um, and therefore, he concluded that the spider toxins are unlikely to show phyletic specificity. So because the spiders obviously need a more generally uh, acting toxins. Another point that he made is that the spider venoms have even toxins have evolved to be injected directly with the use of the fangs into the hemolymph of the insect prey. So. This means they haven't evolved to be um, orally active, and therefore it's unlikely that these compounds are orally active. And then there's other people who um, 
pointed out that the peptide stability could be an issue um, and also the, the cost of production. And I will go into each of these um, arguments and, and show you some examples from my research um, to convince you um, otherwise. Okay, let's dig into it. Um, so first of all, the phyletic specificity. So the example I'm giving you today is a toxin called DC1A, which was isolated from this American desert spider, Digoetia canitis. Um, and so this is the, the typical structure. It's an inhibitor cysteine knot. I'll um, go into that in a few slides time in more detail. But what you should focus on at the moment is this figure here, um, which shows you the activity of this toxin. Um, so the LD50, the dose which kills 50% of the test insect species across four insects that we tested it in. So the first two are dipterans. So that's um, the sheep blowfly the housefly, and then we have um, cockroaches, so the German cockroach and the American cockroach. And interestingly, between the two flies, there's only two-fold difference, so it's more potent in the blowflies than in the houseflies, so that's not a, not a lot of difference, two-fold. But then compared, the cockroaches are even nine-fold less sensitive than the um, housefly. And when we tested in American cockroach, even at the highest dose, that's why it's the dotted line here, um, we didn't really see any, any effect. So between the highest sensitivity and the lowest, there was a more than 430 fold this difference in the um, susceptibility of the insects towards this toxin, which means the American cockroach was basically insensitive and the sheep blowfly was quite sensitive to this toxin. Now, what is the reason for the differences? Um, so we actually, oh, and I forgot to mention that the toxin is also not toxic to, to mice. So it's specific to some of some insect species. Um, so when we looked into the reason for this difference in activity, we actually identified the target of the toxin, which are voltage gated sodium channels. Um, you can see here, um, a figure of a water gated sodium channel. It's basically one big um, protein that's embedded in the plasma membrane. Um, and it's composed of four domains, domain one to four. And each domain itself is composed of six transmembrane segments. The first four form the voltage sensor and five and six form the channel core. And we actually found that the toxin DC1A binds specifically to the domain two and on this domain to, in particular, to this little loop, which is like an external loop between the transmembrane and an extracellular loop between the transmembrane segments one to two. And if we look at the sequence of this loop um, between different insect species, we can actually, actually notice that in this particular position, 805, there's actually two different residues present depending on which insect species uh, we're looking at. So for example, like the German cockroach has the histidine, whereas the American cockroach has a tyrosine in place. And, and we know the American cockroach is insensitive to the toxin, whereas the German cockroach is sensitive. And, um, and we actually found a lot of insects that have the histidine, so they are actually sensitive to the toxin. And we found some others, like some assassin bugs, which we also then tested. And we could show that they were insensitive to the toxin. So it's basically this one residue defines um, whether the toxin can bind to the channel or whether it can't bind. And luckily, the humans, uh, like the human F1.1 subtype, for example, has a tyrosine in this position. So that explains why probably vertebrates like, like mice also, they don't um, bind to this. Um, or the, the toxin doesn't bind to their sodium channel. So that's why we're sort of safe from this toxin. That would make it an ideal candidate um, as a bioinsecticide to, to target particular insect species that actually have this, um, this histidine residue in this particular location. And later on, we, we followed up on another toxin, um, which is called AE1A, which was isolated from a tarantula venom. Um, and that bound to the same um, side on the sodium channel and showed similar, similar effects. 
but how common is the phyletic specificity? Um, the problem is that most people that describe new, new toxins, they only test their toxins against a single insect species, so we don't really have a lot of values where we could compare um, but it's more specific to one or the other organism. But from my own research, I can show you this example. Um, so this is our three toxins from the from an Australian funnel web spider, um, Omega, Hybrid and Kappa, and they are tested against seven insect species. So again, the blowflies, the fruit flies, two species of mosquitoes, then we have an assassin bug, and a cricket and a mealworm. Um, and what we're actually seeing in, in yellow are the most um, potent toxins for that particular um, insect. So for the blowflies, the kappa is the most potent. For the fruit flies, it's the omega and so on. Um, and if we actually look at the differences between the different toxins in the susceptibility of the insects, we can see that it up, um, in, in case of the fruit flies, there's sort of a 23-fold difference between insects to one or the other toxin. And if we compare among the toxins, how they vary between different insect orders, we can see the highest variation, 55-fold, um, is for the omega toxin, which is most potent in fruit flies and least potent in sheep blowflies, which are all, both dipterans. So in the same order of insects, we can see a 55-fold difference. So it seems to be common based on this example and also the DC1A that some toxins only treat particular insect species, but not others uh, in an equally potent way. And so I think this is where actually Wolfgang got, got it wrong. So in order to be able to overcome um, a, diver a diverse array of, of insect species to be a generalist predator. They don't need to have generally broad spectrum um, toxins. So what the spiders have instead is a lot of different toxins and each of them has its own specificity and just a combination of it um, actually enables the spider to overcome um, a broad variety of prey. Now, um, if we come to the oral activity, so I mentioned to be able to be used as, um, as an insecticide on the field, toxins need to be orally active. But the challenge is, because most of the spider toxins are neurotoxins, they need to get into the central nervous system to show effects. So which means they need to be taken up orally, they need to cross the epithelial cells of the midgut into the hemolymph and from there they need to cross the, the sheeting of the membranes to access the central nervous system. So we have potential degradation in the digestive system in the hemolymph and the transfer issue of a peptide across the biological membranes of the gut and the, um, the insect um, blood-brain barrier which means the oral activity can be limited by how stable the toxin is under, under the degradation conditions of you know, um, high pH, for example, in the digestive system and also the enzymatic degradation of the digestive system in hemolymph. And we also have the problem um, of a transfer across biological membranes, which sometimes is not very high for, for peptides. Um, and yeah, I mentioned before, for large scale agricultural applications, we need toxins that are orally active, so they can be sprayed on large acreage crops and the insects then eat them and, and get paralyzed or killed. Um, now, no one actually examined whether spider toxins, like no one did a, um, a systematic study, whether spider toxins are um, orally active, and that's why my, I asked my PhD student, Shaodong Gu, to test 55 arachnid venoms against, um, in an oral assay against two species of flies, so fruit flies and sheep blowflies. And very surprisingly, more than 70% of the venoms showed oral activity in fruit flies, and still about one third of the venoms showed oral activity in the blowfly. So that was totally unexpected. We only expected very few venoms which would show oral activity because as Wolfgang said they haven't evolved to be orally active but to our surprise it was 
actually in, um, in fruit flies it was the vast majority of venoms that showed oral activity. So that was really surprised us. So we can definitely say some, um, actually lots of arachnid venoms show oral toxicity. Um, and then based on these initial studies, my student then isolated two toxins from the most promising orally active venoms, which we call PI1A and ABSP1A. If you look at the bottom row, which shows the oral to injection ratio, um, you can actually see that like the, high, the lower the number, the more potent the oral um, activity is in comparison to the injection activity. And so the, the newly identified ABSP1A is actually the toxin with the lowest uh, number, so with the highest oral activity compared to other toxins that we found to, um, so far from spy. Um, so I mentioned the remarkable stability, which is mainly based on their um, three-dimensional fold, um, which is called an inhibitor cystine knot motif, um, to which most of the um, of the spider or many of the spider toxins um, actually um, comprise to the um, ICK motif. Um, and this is um, this ICK motif is made up of two disulfide bonds which form a ring and then the third one pierces through the ring so it's actually a pseudo knot structure um, and i don't go into too much detail here but i've done some experience experiments where i artificially linearized the toxin so i reduced and alkylated it and the linear version as you can say see in gray is a lot less stable under different temperature conditions it's a lot less stable under high pH. It's a lot less stable under enzymatic degradation using proteinase K. And it's also a lot less stable in lepidopter and hemolymph. Now we did some experiments where we tried to, to improve some of the spider toxins to make them even better um, in terms of oral activity. And this is one of the papers um, that came out of this. Um, so in, in one of the, the things we, we tried was cyclization. So we basically, um, we used the eight residue linker to combine the N and C terminal, um, hoping that this would um, reduce the enzymatic degradation um, of the toxin. And um, indeed, when we injected the toxin into hemolymph, we found it's more stable because it's like the, the LD50 was increased by injection. But to our surprise, when we um, deliver the toxin orally, we found a lower activity. So how, how can we explain that? So we then did an, used the async chamber to, did a, to do a transfer rate assay. So we, we measured the transfer rate basically between the digestive system and the hemolymph. And we found that the transfer rate is significantly reduced when we cyclize the toxin. And that's why the bioavailability in the CNS is decreased and why we see lower oral insecticidal activity. So sometimes the toxin that's made by nature in the spider is, is really hard to improve. So it's actually already the best version that we can get. Um, now finally, on the, on the cost of production. Um, so the example I'm giving you here is Spear. So this is the first um, commercialized spider venom peptide, which was introduced to the market in 2014, um, approved by the US Environmental Protection Agency. And it's uh, made by the company um, Westeron. Um, so and they actually increased their yields. So early 2001, like they still had like milligram per liter yields, and they managed to increase that to more than a thousand fold to grams per liter. And that significantly reduce the production costs of their product, which is only a few cents now per gram, which makes it um, competitive with other chemical insecticides on the market. Now, um, so basically I, I told you why I think none of these arguments um, that Wolfgang made are really true for the spider um, toxins. I think his conclusion that the spider venoms uh, are not suitable insecticides is also not correct. So, but we can say that at least some spider venom peptides can be suitable as bioinsecticide lead. And with that, I like to 
conclude and thank everyone involved in these studies, mainly my um, former supervisor and mentor, um, Glenn King, and some people in his group like Niraj and Xiaodong. Also Paul Aylwood for chemical synthesis of some of the toxins and Graham Nicholson and Frank Bosmans um, for electrophysiological work. And also the members of the German Arachnological Society um, for donating some, some spiders and scorpions for milking and the funding bodies of the Australian Research Council, GRDC, New Farm and the um, University of the Sunshine Coast um, Center for Bioinnovation. Okay, since this is the recorded version of my talk, unfortunately I'm not able to answer your questions live, but if you have some questions regarding my research, feel free to drop me an email and then I'll try to, to answer it. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your interest. Bye. So let's, let's give, give Volker a virtual round of applause for his fascinating presentation. We've probably all seen a lot on spiders, maybe some, um, you know, animal documentations. Uh, and I think it's really fascinating to see also the, the science and chemistry behind, um, behind this. And as Volker said, if you have any questions, please reach out to him by email. And I'm sure he's happy to answer those questions directly. Um, Katya, then I'm going to hand over to you again to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, okay, so indeed it was a very interesting talk. Uh, let's move now for our next speaker, uh, with Stefano Rosa, a PhD student supervised by Dr. Simona Maziero from the Fruit Top Lab of the Department of Biosciences of the University of Milan. His work is focused on the peptide aptamers identification from combinatorial libraries and their application for a sustainable uh, agriculture. So let's uh, hear what Stefano has to share with us. Stefano, please. Thank you, Katia, for the introduction. Um, so could you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. So good morning to everyone. As Katia said, I'm Stefano Rosa, PhD student at the University of Milan. And today I want to uh, give you an overview on my work uh, with uh, combinatorial libraries of cyclic peptides and their usage for the isolation of peptides with antimicrobial activity towards homeases plant pathogens. Uh, just a brief overview of uh, the complete pipeline. So we start from uh, the uh, isolation of the peptides using the tool that we developed in the lab to isolate peptides capable to interact with specific target proteins. After the screening procedure, we select some peptides that undergo to the chemical synthesis process. And these peptides are evaluated in bioactivity assays uh, in the presence of the pathogen in order to see if they retain some kind of antimicrobial activity. At this point, we select our best candidates, so the one that uh, retain the highest level of inhibition of the growth or the infection of the omycetes, and this peptide will be more differently characterized from different point of view. Uh, this pipeline uh, falls in the frame of the NOPEST project that uh, stands for Novel Pesticides for a Sustainable Agriculture. And it is a consortium of different uh, universities and uh, companies. And as, as a final outcome, to find some new alternative, safer alternative to some of the fungicides that are currently applied in the field and uh, are continuously inserted in the list for the substitution by different uh, international uh, uh, authorities. A um, few words about the organism that uh, are under study, um, that are the uh, plant pathogenic OMA seeds. So, um, um, these, uh, these plant pathogens um, um, we have, for example, under study Phytophthora infestans, Phytophthora capsicin, Plasmopara viticola and Pizzum ultimum, 
and the, probably the most well known example of um, of this uh, class of plant pathogen is a phytophthora infestans that, as you can see from the world map, it is a quite widespread all over the globe, and uh, the different uh, areas are colored by the number of sprays. And uh, uh, every year, considering the cost of the treatment and the yield losses, uh, economically speaking, the phytophthora infestans uh, cause causes more than six, six billion uh, of US dollars of losses every year. In the frame of this project, we decided to target the biosynthesis of the cell wall, which could be seen as a barrier, an envelope that surrounds the plasma membrane of, or, of an organism. And uh, it is constituted mainly by different kinds of sugars, polysaccharides, proteins, and in general, uh, it provides uh, resistance to uh, different environmental stresses. It is able to mediate the nutrient uptake and also represent a signaling interface in order to establish intercellular um, interaction. Um, and at the end, it is essential for the development in general for an organism, and more specifically for the homeostasis, it is essential also for the infection process. In order to uh, target the biosynthesis of the cell wall, we decided uh, some um, classes of enzymes that were recognized the main responsible for the biosynthesis of um, the main component of the cell wall, or at least it is reported in literature that they are good antimicrobial target. And uh, we are dealing with uh, more specifically with glycosyl transferases, family two, uh, that is named GT2, and glycosyl hydrolases of the family 72, GH72, that could be macro categorized as carbohydrate active enzymes or calzymes. So, uh, in order to select the, sick, the target proteins, we started um, from um, a bioinformatic analysis that started from the uh, annotation of the different genomes. So, we annotated the, 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 the putative CDS and we tried to find some uh, features that could. Uh, correspond to the description of the GT2 and GH72 calzine classes. Uh, we came up with 72 different enzymes from the different uh, organisms, and at this point we performed a clustering analysis in order to um, uh, divide in clusters based on the conservation of the different protein amino acid sequences. And uh, this uh, uh, enables, uh, uh, in, as long as we thought that uh, an higher level of conservation probably will implicate that uh, these uh, enzymes uh, have a more relevant role in the physio physiology of the organism. After a clustering filtering procedure, we came up with uh, uh, eight clusters and 42 proteins that were analyzed singularly from a topology point of view in order to uh, see their suitability for the assay. Um, a literature search in order to see if some of the identified protein targets um, were already reported in literature and, uh, have, uh, for, and uh, they were also purposed from some authors as potential antimicrobial targets and also another functional annotation. At the end, we selected uh, 13 date proteins, so target proteins that spans uh, that are divided uh, almost equally from, uh, between all the organisms under study. And more specifically, we selected eight belonging to the GT2 class and five belonging to the GH72 class. Now I want to introduce um, how we isolate cyclic peptides. And uh, we start from a very simple molecular biology tool that 
probably most of you know, is the is to hybrid assay. Um, that is a classical way to test binary protein protein interaction. It relies on a transcription factor that is the GAL4 protein that is split in two parts, the DNA binding domain that is fused to a bait protein, or in our case, our target protein, the cadzines, and uh, the GAL4 activation domain that is fused to a prey protein. And uh, our prey protein is the library of combinatorial cyclic peptides in our case. Only when there is an interaction between the bait and the prey, the GAL4 activity is restored. And so we can monitor the presence of this interaction uh, by, uh, by looking at um, colonies, yeast colonies that grow on selected media thanks to the activation of the reported genes that we are currently using. If there's no interaction between the bait and the prey, the activity of the GAL4 is not reconstituted, and so that uh, is cell will die and we cannot recover on select it on selected plates. This is uh, our tool, so uh, uh, how we isolate uh, cyclic peptides. Uh, we exploit an, an, an engineered version of the intain from Synecochistis. Uh, intain are, cell, are cell splicing uh, protein. So um, by inserting uh, the generated codon sequence that is uh, um, eight NMK codons, so the peptide is constituted by eight amino acids in a precise, a precise position uh, between the two intain domains that are named intain C and intain N, um, we can produce a cyclic peptide after the splicing of the intain and uh, that remains attached to the intain C subunit. Instead, the intain M subunit is excised from the molecular structure. In this way, we can expose the cyclic peptide on the molecular scaffold, and we could uh, that could be easily assayed for the interaction with the uh, target protein. This, uh, this um, process of splicing can be monitored through Western blot by looking at the upper and lower band, the upper one corresponds to the full length protein, so the unspliced one, and the lower band corresponds to the uh, spliced protein that uh, currently produce the cyclic peptides. Uh, this kind uh, of library is used, as I said before, in uh, east hybrid screening. So the, the intain C is fused to the GAL4 activation domain. And so after the cyclization, the cyclic peptide could be assayed for the interaction with the specific cadzyme. At the end, we obtain a list of cyclic peptides capable to interact with, uh, with the protein of choice. Just a curiosity, we also performed a proof of concept work in which we isolated the different cyclic peptides able to interact with the GAL4 protein, and we isolate uh, one, peptide, uh, one, one peptide that is also able to modulate its activity in yeast cells. At this point, uh, we have uh, identified the target, we developed the tool, and uh, um, so we have to perform the yeast hybrid. From the yeast hybrid, we obtain the list of cyclic peptides that interact with a specific cadzyme. And after a filtering procedure that uh, we implemented in our lab and a calculation about the putative peptide solubility in order to uh, be easily assayed, we select a subset that will undergo to the chemical synthesis and uh, subsequent bioactivity assays that start from the screening, from a screening. So we tried the peptide, all the peptides at the same concentration in order to see if there is um, an activity, an inhibition of growth on the plant pathogen. The one that show um, an inhibition of the growth 
will be also uh, tried at different uh, concentration in those response analysis and at the end will be also evaluated on leaf tissues in leaf disc bioassays in order to see if the peptide is able to maintain its activity also on plant tissues. Um, we currently uh, synthesized using this pipeline dozens of peptides that have somehow um, inhibitory activity on the plant pathogen under studies, but Today, I want to concentrate mainly on these two peptides that currently are our best candidates that are named CP20 and CP32. I have to say sorry because I'm not going to show the peptide sequences because we are under the um, patenting procedure. So CP20 and 32 targets respectively the Phytophthalin infestants, cellulose synthase A3, and cellulose synthesis A2. And uh, as you can see from the graph on the left, the, um, uh, this is the percentage protection index uh, relative to these two peptides on phytophthalin infestants. That is substantially a, a percentage of reduction of growth of treated samples respect to control samples. And the, here the peptide is delivered at our uh, screening concentration that is quite high. And uh, it, many peptides are, are screened together using this uh, scheme. So multi-well plates with solid medium uh, with or without the peptide in which the uh, plant pathogen is inoculated as mycelium plug. At this point, we want to address if which are um, um, at which concentration the control over the growth of phytophthalin infestants could be effective. So this time we uh, perform a dose response analysis in liquid medium uh, in which we inoculated phytophthalin infestants sporangia uh, in the presence of uh, serial dilutions of the peptide concentration, uh, and also we included the control treatment, the time of treatment, and the treatment with uh, commercially available fungicides as positive control of the assay. And as you can see, uh, looking at the EC50 and 99 values that are the effective concentrations, so the concentration uh, needed to reproduce the 50% uh, of the uh, overall effects of observed. Uh, the C50 are mm, very, very close. Instead, the C99 are more fl fluctuating. But this analysis demonstrates that the initial concentration, screen concentration, could be decreased. At this point, we wondered whether uh, the um, these peptides could have an effect also on the other organism under study, as long as the um, the sequence that we used in the yeast hybrid screening it has a very very high conservation with the other um, with the homologous protein of the other organism under studies that ranges between the 99 and 96 percent. And uh, those are the results. Uh, and as you can see, the AC50 values for, in all the pathogen are substantially reproduced or even lower with respect to uh, phytophthalin infestants. And there are higher fluctuations for what concerns the C99. But uh, we can say that uh, these peptides has a bioactivity also towards all the other uh, all my seeds taken in consideration, and so they have a good spectrum of action. Uh, as final experiment that I'm going to show you uh, are these ex vivo experiments, so in which we co inoculated the, um, the, uh, the plant pathogen and our cyclic peptides, or we inoculated the, the, um, in the post inoculation treatment, or we inoculated the plant pathogen 24 hours 
before the treatment with the fat fiber. So we want to address also the, um, the, po the potential of these peptides to uh, decrease the infection also uh, uh, in um, post-inoculation treatment. And as you can see, both from the uh, images and from the graphs that quantitatively recapitulate what we are currently see on leaf disc, uh, in the co-inoculation treatment, CP20 and CP32 behave substantially in an unequal way. Instead, in the, um, in the post-inoculation treatment, CP32 um, have a slightly better um, inhibition of the infection with respect to CP20. And it is some, somehow comparable to the co-inoculation treatment. Uh, in this uh, essay, it is included also as positive control of the essay uh, of fungicide treatment. So uh, now we are currently assaying different uh, modified variants of uh, CP20 and CP32 in order to address which are the, the more relevant uh, residues of the peptide sequence for the, um, that cause their bioactivity. And we are going also to uh, try to demonstrate the interaction between the cyclic peptides and the target protein in vivo in phytopter infestants. We uh, are planning in the future to perform toxicity tests, especially thanks to the expertise of the company that is present in the project. And um, uh, we, we are currently performing some uh, microscopy studies to understand the cellular uptake. And uh, we are currently thinking about some strategies to increase the cellular uptake of these peptides. As final summary, I can say that this tool can be easily used to discover bioactive peptides de novo and uh, virtually towards any kind of protein. Additionally, uh, as I said before, we developed this proof of concept work in which we demonstrated that we are able to um, isolate peptides capable to modulate the activity of GAL4 protein, that is a transcription factor. And uh, as I said in the previous slide, the CP20 and 32 will be more deeply characterized uh, in, the, in the near future. And now I want to thank uh, my tutor, that is Simona Manziero, and uh, the coordinator of the project, uh, Paolo Pesaresi, all the other members um, um, of uh, at the, here at the University of Milan and all the members of the No Pest Consortium. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano, for this inviting uh, presentation. I think we'll quick kickstart the discussion um, with a quick question from Katya. Yeah, hi, Stefano. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting. Uh, and impressive work. Um, you. You, you not only uh, identified some uh, potent peptides towards your target, but also uh, managed to identify the possible mechanism of action. And as we all know that uh, the major drawbacks uh, to apply peptides in the field is uh, their um, cost of production, but hopefully we have very encouraging results as we saw uh, in uh, Volker's presentation uh, with the introduction in the market of the first uh, peptide-based uh, insecticide. But have you already uh, started to work out uh, this uh, specific aspect or try to see how you will um, manage the production either by biofactories or something? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it's something that uh, we are getting in touch with different companies uh, also in Europe uh, that uh, are currently working uh, on uh, this aspect uh, and that um, and uh, they want to try to produce peptides, add technologies to produce peptides uh, uh, through fermentation. And uh, we are also starting to work in our lab for the production of these peptides uh, through fermentation 
and uh, also by using the uh, try to produce them in plants and uh, to do so we are we have uh, we are th thinking to produce them using another version of the same intain gene that we are currently use in the East hybrid but it is even more modified and uh, after the splicing it releases the cyclic peptides and do not retain it uh, attached to the scaffold so uh, at this the state of the art about uh, this thing uh, is not uh, a major field but uh, we are moving it in this direction and uh, another thing that I want to say that uh, probably will decrease the cost of uh, the application uh, will be the implementation uh, with uh, uh, precision farming agriculture that uh, also in our project we have a partner at the University of De La Rioja in Spain that is working in the development of uh, det on detection tools in order to try to um, deliver only the pattern where it is needed and the concentration that is needed. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully you'll you'll uh, get to 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 find uh, a solution for for this. Um, okay, so I I was just curious about something. Um, I saw that uh, you you use a bioinformatic approach to to first uh, search for uh, your peptide sequences. Uh, did you? taking into account the numbers uh, of AMP predictors that exist, did you ever try to, to use uh, AMP predictors uh, in your workflow? Or did you just uh, look to, uh, to conserve the uh, sequences among them? No, we looked uh, only for uh, to select the target proteins uh, we looked for the conservation uh, among the omicids and the one thing that I that I said that I not said in the talk is that that any uh, selected protein was also checked to be somehow uh, have a low conservation in other organism and especially important organism like humans and other known organisms that are present in the environment and then relevant for the ecosystem. So uh, in some way, we are trying to uh, select something that is conserved among the omicids and pathogens. And so to have a wide spectrum of action among on different omicids, but at the same time, by selecting peptides toward a domain or a specific protein that has a low conservation on all the other organisms, uh, we try to reduce also the off-target effects. But uh, this is only what we have done. Don't we have taken in consideration other kind of analysis? Okay, perfect, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, there is a question from Norbert. Norbert. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and also for the for the uh, study, uh, which was really uh, done very carefully. And also, the, the design. I was just wondering. Uh, you showed uh, one slide where you applied uh, 0.2 millimolar concentration um, to to see the effect. Um, how does this uh, translate uh, when when you think about? Uh, agricultural ap applications. So how much peptide would you need per hectare? <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's a question that uh, it was asked us uh, many times. Uh, it is very, very difficult to say now uh, a precise uh, um, uh, response, but I think that um, um, this concentration needs to be lower to be suitable for agricultural purposes, um, for sure. And this will be probably um, performed by, for example, working on the uptake of uh, the peptides as, low, uh, as, as long as if we uh, implement the uptake in uh, the OMI6 cells, we will be able also to decrease the concentration needed. 
but also um, as probably these peptides uh, needs other years to be available on the market, hopefully. So in these years, we will work also on other kind of technologies of delivery, for example, the precision farming tools that I previously mentioned. And uh, we are also thinking about uh, um, other kind of encapsulation that will probably decrease the amount needed. But, uh, and also on the cost on the production that even if need or higher levels of peptide, uh, if it is uh, uh, cheap to produce these peptides and they have a good specificity, it doesn't matter how in a certain limit, but how much peptide we need to spray. But nowadays I cannot uh, say which amount of peptide are envisioned for a field application. It is very, very difficult because uh, many factors are included in this kind of consideration. Of course, thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, one last question before we, before, we, before we move on by Emilio. Okay. Uh, yes, Stefano, th many, many thanks for your presentation and interesting approach. Uh, my, my question is related to two aspects. Uh, one is uh, about the stability of uh, these citric peptides in, in, in the natural environment of the plant uh, and uh, in the presence of the pathogen. And, and the second is about the toxicity. You, you have uh, indicated that this is in progress, but do you have any idea on the possible uh, uh, toxicity of this uh, type of peptides? Okay, um, so uh, about the stability, we are currently performing a characterization that uh, till now is uh, at the lab level, so we are trying uh, in the presence of protease, mix of proteases, uh, we try the different temperatures, substantially different kind of stresses, but at the lab, lab level, and uh, we are trying also on the peptide powder and the peptide in solution at different concentration. And now I can say that for at least the CP20 and CP32 peptides, the um, stability is more than expected. They could uh, stay, for example, more than two weeks uh, at 50, 60 degrees, uh, or uh, they, uh, they are quite stable also in the presence of proteases. I do not have uh, data at the moment for the uh, for their stability, for example, on leaf tissues or um, or uh, in the presence of the pathogen. But I think that these uh, lab lab experiments are quite encouraging. For the uh, second part uh, that is about the toxicity, um, I'm not sure them in the presentation, but we have a previous experience in which we used um, a library of linear peptides uh, and not cyclic peptides, and we perform a different toxicity test, and the peptide is quite specific, does not have any kind of effects on human cells, bacteria, uh, plants, uh, and, and different kind of organism, and we are trying also uh, for the CP2032 to start to perform um, some toxicity test always at the lab level, and we saw that at least on two or three, till now, a uh, few species of bacteria, they does not have any kind of effect on their growth. So, well, we we hope that our strategy to select to screen towards um, targets that are specific for the OMI seeds will pay somehow. Great, thank you, Stefano, um, and thanks again for the great uh, presentation, and also thanks everyone for the for the really nice discussions. And I am now going to hand over to Paolo, who will. Uh, introduce our last speaker. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ruben. It's indeed a pleasure to introduce the last speaker, certainly last but not least, because he's an authority in this field. So let me introduce you, uh, Dr. Emilio Montesinos, who is uh, a professor of crop science, uh, plant pathology at the University of Girona, Spain. Uh, Emilio was built as a microbiologist uh, by the Univers Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, um, and then he developed his career in uh, Catalonia in different institutions, but also was a visiting lecturer at the plant pathology department at Cornell in the States in, 19, in 1994. <clears throat> his main uh, research focus is the integrated control of fruit tree diseases with a special focus on uh, <clears throat> pardon me, biopesticides and antimicrobial peptides. So, in the focus of our, of our discussion. He is uh, author of more than 100 scientific paper and 25 book chapters in this field, but most importantly, uh, 30 research projects funded by different authorities at national and international level, including EU and uh, 35 R&D contracts with private companies. He is uh, uh, presently director of the Plant Health Innovation and Development Center of the University of Girona, uh, and he, um, among other honors, was the, the recipient of the government of Catalonia's uh, Narcis Monturiol Meldal in 2012. So the, 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 the title of the presentation is uh, The Potential of Functional Peptides for the Control of Emerging Diseases Caused by Pathogenic Bacteria. Please, Emilio. Uh, thank you, Paolo, for the introduction and also a special thanks uh, for uh, Katia Teixeira for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Uh, I, I think the topic is very adequate to the, the situation of the research uh, in, in, in peptide applications. And uh, my title includes uh, not uh, a specific name for the peptides, uh, it's just functional peptides because uh, up to now, uh, uh, the functional peptides include uh, antimicrobial and uh, uh, plant defense elicitor peptides and multifunctional peptides of different types. Uh, you can see here a picture of uh, olive uh, tree field in Italia, in, uh, in the Puglia region, uh, which is uh, devastated since uh, 2013 by a bacteria. Uh, which his name is uh, Shailella fastidiosa. So this will be one of uh, my, the target of my presentation. Um, to start uh, with the presentation, I, I have to say that the, the functional peptides uh, in all cases came from, from natural uh, basis. And uh, in the nature, we have uh, peptides uh, in all living things, uh, from plants and animals, uh, in which uh, they are the first barrier of innate immunity, but also they are produced by several microorganisms and involved in a very important processes of antibiosis, so of competition for, for the environment and the nutrient sources. Up to now, we know more than 1,000 compounds now, probably 2,000 or more even. Uh, you can see here uh, at the bottom the uh, one of the papers that uh, deal with the uh, database, which I find important, and, and a link to this uh, database uh, for your interest. So in our case, we started our research uh, through a collaboration uh, 20, more than 20 years ago with the Lipso Laboratory uh, from the University of Girona. They are expertise in peptide chemistry. And uh, my, my own group is an expertise in plant pathology. So we shared a common interest uh, many years ago. In fact, we start with uh, structures and uh, function of different peptides in living organisms. And through this uh, strategy of molecular design, uh, which is now very advanced, we develop it, uh, develop uh, currently uh, different uh, libraries uh, that are screened, that are synthesized by different ways. 
uh, there are cyclic and linear peptides. And these peptides that are synthesized uh, are uh, screened uh, in vitro for antimicrobial activity, but also for plant defense uh, elicitation using uh, uh, tobacco cell cultures. And some of the leader peptides uh, were still introduced in the, the redesign and, and, and new, new peptide synthesis. And after a few cycles of this process, we get with very good peptides that are uh, these uh, lead peptides uh, are submitted to uh, hemolytic activity, uh, determination, protease stability, some kinds of preliminary toxicity using uh, the, the warm uh, kind of rapidity elegance. And of course, efficacy testing uh, that is grown from uh, in vitro testing on, on detached leaves or portion of leaves or flowers through plants in the greenhouse. And you will see in, in one example, uh, a field test. So these improved peptides, I will present here only uh, three of the hundreds of peptides we have developed together with the LIPSO laboratory during these uh, past uh, 20 years. The most famous is BP100, which is a uh, un linear undecapeptide containing all proteinogenous amino acids. Uh, this peptide came from secropin and melitin uh, uh, moieties, and it has an helical wheel structure. And very interestingly, the bactericidal activity is very strong. Uh, uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration is around 2.5 micromolar, which is a very, very good result. Uh, some groups uh, of research, not in our case, but in Germany, in a, in, in a group uh, uh, leader by Helen Berger, uh, discovered that this is a cell penetrating peptide in plant cells. So uh, very interesting also. We did some uh, tests uh, with the company for uh, the, seeing the toxicity in mice and it's really a non-toxic peptide. A second family of peptides uh, are endogenous peptides produced by plants. And we have been focused uh, by, uh, with a group of Maria Pla and my own university on peptides from rosaceae plants. And we uh, find uh, a peptide uh, of 28 amino acids. This is this, the consensus sequence of this peptide. This is the, uh, the putative structure. And uh, interestingly, this is no antimicrobial activity in this peptide but it, uh, it is obviously a plant defense stress elicitor. The activity is uh, just a nanomolar concentration level. So this peptide uh, has a very, very good uh, uh, performance uh, for our requirements. And the third uh, family or group of peptides uh, we call B-functional, uh, were a family of peptides developed from uh, conjugates uh, from the BP100 peptide. But uh, these peptides were developed to be expressed uh, heterologously in, in plants. And uh, we added uh, some uh, portions of uh, the ACPA hinge, uh, the KDEL secretion uh, sequence, and a portion of the Maganin uh, peptide. So this very uh, highly hybrid peptide have this structure, uh, um, putatively, uh, there are two alpha helical wheels uh, uh, linked by, uh, by this uh, APA hinge. And interestingly, this peptide has a strong bactericidal activity, like in the case of BP100, but it's a strong plant defense stress elicitor. And the metal oral dose in mice, uh, it's uh, it's very high, which means that it's not uh, non-toxic. So um, for the first group of, of peptides, which are the lytic ones, uh, well, I, I have indicated here uh, a few of our uh, papers uh, published since uh, uh, the early 20s, uh, 200, uh, 2000 years uh, until recently. 
And you can see here against uh, a very important bacterial plant pathogen, Pseudomonas syringae, uh, with a scanning electron microscope, how this peptide, uh, DP178, but also the other from the SECMEL11 library, they produce this stabilization of the uh, outer and inner membrane. You can see here the shrinked uh, cells of the bacteria that are uh, alive. And also recently we have published a paper in phytopathology um, revealing that this peptide, BP178, is very, very active against Shilella fastidiosa. You see here the cells, the typical cells with the uh, cristate uh, outer membrane structure. But here you can see the porous uh, mate, the, the, the holes, uh, uh, text virtually made on the on, on the cell envelope uh, in these cases. Uh, depending on the concentrations, we can find complete destructuration of cells. So these peptides are very active as lytic peptides. And of course, they are bactericidal. And uh, the second group, which are the plant defense elicitor peptides, uh, I'm sorry because this scheme is very complicated, but uh, I, I will try to explain very, very simply. Uh, we know that the plant cell responds uh, to external visitors like, like uh, microbial associated molecular patterns, pathogen associated molecular patterns, and there are specific receptors on the, on the cell membrane that uh, uh, upon interaction with these elicitors, uh, they uh, develop um, a, a, a process of signal uh, through kinase cascades uh, and, and other processes that induce the uh, defense response of the, of the plant cell with uh, hyperoxidation processes, uh, production of hormones, uh, uh, transcription factors and, and synthesis of antimicrobials, as essentially many PR proteins, uh, as defense proteins, calorie deposition, so this is a very well-known process in plants. But there is another process discovered uh, in uh, 2000, described in 2013 by, by the Hufaker uh, group from the USDA, and, uh, in which the, there is an, uh, an involvement of a type of endogenous peptides in which the, the, the plant cell produce uh, uh, a kind of uh, peptides that are secreted externally, and they act as uh, self, uh, self uh, elicitors uh, through a specific receptor. So we uh, wanted to take advantage of these endogenous elicitors, and we developed it, uh, we studied uh, with a group of Maria Pla uh, about uh, more than 50 uh, species of Rosacea plants, and deduce the consensus sequence for this uh, peptide. Interestingly, the synthesis of these uh, different families of, of peptides, when uh, the synthetic product was tested, there was no antimicrobial activity compared to BP100. You can see here, this is survival of uh, uh, Xanthomonas arboricola patoa pruri, which is a, a uh, pathogen of uh, prunus, a bacterial pathogen, compared with VP100, which is very, very active. Uh, this peptide, uh, for example, one uh, of the peptides from uh, prunus dulcis, from almond, uh, was not an, uh, active as antimicrobial, but when applied to the plant, to, 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 to almond and, and peach plants, uh, there was a strong reaction of uh, induction of the expression of uh, several genes. In this table, there is only a list of them, but you can see this PR4, which is a, a, a PR. Um, this was uh, induced at uh, 12, uh, 24 hours, but PR5 is another kind of protein uh, involved in defense. But uh, if, you, if you look at this and compare with the effect of infection with Xanthomonas pruni, we saw that uh, the effect of the uh, priming with this peptide is similar to the one uh, produced by an infection. 
So uh, here in the right hand, you can see the results of one of the experiments done with plants. Uh, the leaves are presented here. When there is no toxicity by this peptide, you can see when the Xanthomonas concentration increases, uh, of course, in the non-treated control, you see the typical infection and, and damage, but uh, the peptide protects uh, very well from infection. So uh, these uh, data have been published in different uh, journals that you can find. Uh, the third type uh, of uh, our main family of peptides is a multifunctional, uh, bifunctional peptide BP178. Uh, we have uh, here the sequence, it's made of 29 amino acids. And interestingly, this peptide is bactericidal, uh, but not fungicidal. Here you can see the reduction in survivors in, a, in an in vitro test. Uh, comparing BP100 and BP178, uh, the uh, black uh, triangles indicate reduction in survivors. So at uh, just uh, very low concentrations, uh, which is uh, around uh, uh, two to three micromolar, you can see that there is a, a reduction of uh, near uh, uh, 10 to the five times the, the, the viability of cells and uh, similar to the, to the BP100, but there is no activity against Botrytis in area. You can see the black triangles, uh, no, no production. With the resasurine test uh, using fluorescence units, we can measure the cell activity. And we see that the cell activity decreases as soon as the reduction in survival increases. So this is very active peptide that uh, uh, textually kill the cells, but not in the case of botrytis in area. The surprise was when we uh, made an assay of control of infections in, in tomato plants using Pseudomonas syringe patower tomato, Xanthomonas campestris patower vesicatoria, and Botrytis cinerea. And then we saw that uh, this peptide controlled uh, not only bacterial plant pathogen infections, but also Botrytis cinerea. And this contrasted uh, very much with the fact that uh, it was not uh, antifungal. Uh, and then we analyzed it by using a microarray, uh, DNA microarray, uh, in an experiment uh, determining uh, what is the effect of the uh, exogenous application by spraying on tomato plants by BP178 peptide. And we saw that uh, this peptide uh, produced an overexpression of around 100 uh, genes most of them involved in, in plant defense. Uh, we compare it with other treatments, for example, with jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, ethylene, and the flagellin 15, which is a plant defense elicitor, is, is, is also a peptide uh, from uh, of 15 amino acids. So obviously, our peptide compared with the effect of salicylic or jasmonic acid or even ethylene induces the overexpression of less genes, but those genes are very important because uh, this uh, defense elicitation on the plant, this priming, protects against infections uh, by botrytis in area. Even this peptide, this bifunctional peptide is, is uh, much, uh, much better than the BP100. Uh, so this data was reported in a recent paper in Frontiers in Plant Science by my research group. Another aspect that has been considered by some of uh, the preceding uh, speakers is uh, the main issue in the peptide uh, technology for, for use them uh, in, in plant protection, which is the preparative production, is the, the cost and the amount of peptide we can produce. As you probably all uh, you know very well, Solid phase uh, chemical synthesis is the most common approach used for us uh, for research purposes. Even uh, in our laboratory, the Lipso group uh, uh, can synthesize, for example, you can see here around six grams of, 
of BP hundred. So the, the the cost of this peptide is enormous because uh, the current prices that you can find in the internet are between uh, uh, five hundred and one thousand euros per gram. So if you pretend to use this peptide for agricultural use and you calculate the amount of peptide needed for treatment of, of an hectare of fruit trees, uh, really the cost of uh, the treatment increases uh, over uh, the benefit of the crop. So that's a problem that has to be solved. In the uh, preceding presentations, uh, especially the, the one from Volk, um, uh, he, he provided information about a company that I know very well because we have been in some contact in the past, uh, which is Vesteron, uh, about microbial biofactories. And the, the most promising system up to now is, is uh, the heterologous expression in, in, in Pikia Pastoris, also in Nikolai. And the uh, average production is uh, around... Uh, a half a gram per liter, which is uh, still very interesting. But uh, in my laboratory, we wanted uh, a few years ago to, to explore the possibility of using plant biofactories as a mean of production. And we, we use a rice. We use a rice uh, and targeting the, uh, the heterologous expression of uh, the peptide to uh, BP178 in the rice seed endosperm. So we arrived at, uh, to uh, maximum amounts of uh, around 20 milligrams per kilogram of seed. Uh, we don't have an idea of the cost of them because uh, it depends very much on the scale uh, of production. Um, just I have to show you one of the uh, papers we have published uh, in BLC Prime Biology that were a uh, consequence of the PhD thesis uh, of uh, Laura Montesinos on, uh, on rice uh, seeds. Uh, and the gene construct that was more uh, successful for uh, production of BP178 was. Uh, uh, using the globulin, globulin one uh, promoter that is typical in the in the rice seed endosperm, and uh, we inserted in the construct uh, the sequence of uh, the peptide uh, BP178. Of of course, these are amino acids and have to be translated to the the three uh, bases codon uh, for expression using the NOS terminator and the uh, globulin promoter. So we succeeded in several of the lines. You can see here uh, five uh, rice lines expressing the uh, peptide. This is a Western blot uh, in which the peptide is clearly shown here. This was the empty vector uh, line uh, in which there is no production. And this is from the endosperm. And this is a, a calibration curve using different amounts of, uh, of peptide. Uh, one surprise we, we had was that the, the peptide is apparently uh, uh, of difference, bigger than the, the expected from the synthetic one. Uh, and probably they are uh, dimmer, trimers. Uh, it is a multimeric uh, uh, structure. And uh, of course, uh, probably there are some, uh, some modifications uh, by the plant. But interestingly, when we recover the peptide by a very, very easy method, we do not require uh, complex uh, biochemical purification procedures. We saw that the, this is a test, in vitro test, uh, colonies of, uh, uh, one of the plant pathogenic bacteria of rice, which is Dicaria, Dicaria doranti. And uh, uh, you see here the uh, extract from the, the control plants, the anti-vector. And uh, we saw the different batches of the, of the production of the peptide that are uh, active. Uh, so the conclusion is that uh, the peptide produced in the rice endosperm was, was active. And uh, by means of other methods that I'm not showing here, using uh, 
magnetic resonance and, uh, and uh, mass spectrometry methods, we determined that certainly the TAC frequent sequences of the peptide are there. And, uh, and so the conclusion was that uh, it's comparable to the synthetic peptide in, in terms of activity. And uh, the last uh, slide uh, uh, about our results is, is the only uh, uh, important reported uh, uh, field test uh, using uh, one peptide, which is this, this peptide is BP15, is from the same family of secropin melitine uh, uh, on the peptides I have mentioned before. Uh, these family of peptides are already patented uh, for use in, in crop protection. And there is a change in one of the amino acids uh, compared to the BP100. Interestingly, uh, we, uh, we had the opportunity to test uh, this peptide in field testing. Uh, of course, not uh, spraying the whole trees because the cost was uh, really high, but spraying uh, branches uh, with fruits and, and with uh, leaves uh, of, of, of these uh, pear trees in the field. And uh, this peptide we also uh, studied in more detail uh, that binds to the gel tubes. You can see here a, um, a conjugated uh, BP15 peptide with Texas red uh, reporter. And you can see here the germ tubes uh, in reddish uh, areas, indicating that the peptide binds uh, very efficiently to the germ tubes. These are the spores, okay? And uh, the action of inhibition is, is done directly on the, on the germination of the spores. And you can see here a biotest uh, made with detached leaves. In the, this is a non-traded control, and this is uh, traded with BP15. And uh, finally, the results from field um, have been published in the Journal Plant Disease by, by Mireia Puch uh, as a leader because this was part of her uh, PhD thesis. And here I show six uh, trials in which in all the trials there was an effect of the peptide in controlling the severity uh, of uh, disease on leaves, the number of lesions for leaves. And the efficacy was really good between 50 and 60%, except in one case in which the statistical leader were no significant differences. But in the other cases, there was really an effect of the peptide. So the performance of this Segmel 11 Undeca peptide in the field was very, very good. Uh, and there was another test that I have not uh, present, uh, I did not present data that was done in the United States by the professor George uh, Sanding in the, in Apple, uh, uh, <clears throat> in a field test also in Apple during bloom uh, to control uh, fire blight caused by the bacteria Arminia amylo. And uh, that's all. Finally, to say to see that uh, to say that uh, uh, we are currently working on two uh, main uh, projects that involve uh, the, probably the most uh, dangerous bacteria that uh, we have faced uh, in the last years uh, in Europe, uh, which is Silella fastidiosa. That is affecting uh, olive trees, but also almond uh, and uh, grapevine and uh, citrus. But the main problems are produced in Italy in olive trees in the Puglia region and also in Spain in almond in the Alicante region. And this uh, we got recently in a consortium with many other partners, uh, a project named Bexil, uh, which is uh, uh, means uh, Shailella fastidiosa uh, methods for control. And the objective of the project is uh, mainly directed to biological control agents. Uh, most of them produce antimicrobial peptides 
and also to a novel family of, uh, of functional peptides. And we participate especially in this, in this part. I have to say also that we have ongoing projects from, funded by the National Ministry of Education and, and Science of Spain, in which uh, we develop, um, together with the LIPSO laboratory, anti-biofilm uh, peptides against Shailella fastidiosa, anti-motility peptides, and uh, peptides designed uh, specifically to target uh, key processes in the bacteria. I'm not going to detail in this, in this part of project because uh, it's too long for, for my exposure. And the other disease in which we are involved in another European project uh, called PHLV is the uh, citrus greening uh, of uh, citrus that is caused by uh, Candidatus liberibacter uh, sciaticus. Um, uh, uh, and it's not present in the European Union, but is, uh, we are very worried about the possible introduction. And in this project, we uh, perform a collaboration with Funda Citrus in Brazil. Uh, and we are just uh, starting testing uh, several of our peptides uh, in uh, experiments on the uh, greenhouse. And probably we will go in the future to the field. The question now is that uh, since the peptides are very, very expensive uh, to be produced, at least our peptides at this moment, uh, and these two pathogens, Cellella fastidiosa and Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, uh, are endoph endophytes of, of the plants. So they live, in the case of Cellella, in the xylem, uh, in the xylem, uh, uh, system of the plant. And in the case of, uh, of uh, Liberibacter, it lives in the phloem, as in the case of the phytoplast. Uh, our approach is by endotherapy, which means that uh, we inject with a high precision injection system uh, these uh, small plantlets because we have to, to work uh, in under biosafety uh, conditions. Uh, and we use the small plants just to test uh, as a proof of concept uh, all these peptides uh, I have shown before. The problem with this uh, bacteria, especially with Shailella, is that uh, you have to need to, to have a, a biosafety greenhouse, uh, biosafety laboratories, because this bacteria is a quarantine plant pathogen in the European Union. So we have to work as for the coronavirus uh, virtually, uh, in, uh, in negative uh, pressure labs uh, with the uh, wearing a special uh, wearing system and the greenhouse should be protected against vectors, against uh, leakage of, of, of the bacteria uh, outside. So these, these are the projects in which we are uh, involved now. The list of acknowledgements is so long that I have not uh, presented a list. Uh, if you like to know who is collaborating with us, um, uh, you can go more in deep to the papers I have uh, indicated in my presentation. So that's my last slide. Many thanks. You have the, here is a picture of Girona. If you have the opportunity to come here, you will be welcome. Thanks uh, to everybody. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cool. <laughs> Are you ahead? Okay, thank you. Oh. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Emilia, for this uh, interesting and stimulating presentation. I, I have a quick comment and a question just to break the ice. Uh, the, the comment is uh, about the, the problem of uh, uh, large scale production and uh, inherent cost of, of these uh, peptides, uh, raised also by, by Folker. Uh, the comment is it is very interesting and stimulating to see that uh, fermentation biotechnology at large uh, um, recombinant plant as you presented can help in this uh, in this field but uh, don't forget that uh, synthetic large scale uh, synthetic preparation of peptides driven by the large number of peptide therapeutics entering the market is 
really uh, growing fast and giving uh, an interesting opportunities. And I would say this is uh, another example of a minority research field in which, on the other end, uh, peptide chemists could uh, uh, do uh, in important make important contribution. Uh, the, the, my question that I have a tech, let, let's say technical question. You show us that the BP one seventy eight peptide is a sort of a complex chimera of different components, including the P one hundred uh, peptide, mm -hmm. which is also a cell penetrating peptide. So the question is, how important is the, the cell penetrating property uh, in the uh, activity of, of, the, of the larger, the BP178 peptide? Yeah, it's an important question, but we have no answer to this at this moment. Uh, what, what we know is that the BP178 is a strong plant defense receptor. Uh, but we don't know exactly what is the mechanism of action. Probably he is, uh, the, the peptide is interacting with, with receptors in the membrane of the plant cell uh, also, not, not only penetrating inside. But uh, as you know, uh, this requires a more detailed uh, analysis and, and, and a problem which is very common with peptides is when uh, you, you need to link the peptide to conjugate the peptide with a reporter. And uh, you are not sure, never sure that the reporter do not introduce a distortion on the, on the, on the results. So there are many, many studies, including our study with the BP15 uh, uh, conjugated to the Texas red. So uh, we are not sure that uh, this interaction uh, is not the, with the germ tubes, is not the result of a synergistic effect between the Texas red and the peptide. So uh, uh, probably the only way is to use isotopes of the, of the peptide uh, without the reporter, the fluorescent reporter, and, but this is very complicated. So uh, this is one way. The other is just to follow the same as in other authors uh, to in fact, we have BP178 uh, with, with reporter um, uh, and uh, we, we can do these studies of interaction. So this is on question. And the other is that uh, we don't know if there are internal targets in the bacterial cell uh, apart from the membrane. What is clear that this peptide uh, makes a strong distortion in the cell membrane of most of the plant pathogenic bacteria we have tested. Not, not only Shailella, also Pseudomonas, Xanthomonas, Erbinia. Uh, and in general, uh, these peptides are less effective against fungi uh, and also against gram positive bacteria. So there should be something specific uh, in the gram negative bacteria that made these uh, peptides more effective on them. But this is for the future. As the, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Emilio. I think that Ruben has a question. And then yes. I, I'll start, first of all, I'll start with a question uh, from the chat. The question comes from Paula Gomez. First of all, Emilio, she, she thanks you for the great talk. And her question is, should peptides like these be also screened against plant protective microbiota to check for selectivity? Yes, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, I, I'm sure that there is no chemical uh, pesticide or biopesticide or even microbial biopesticide that has no uh, non-target effects on the microbiota of, of the plants. Uh, uh, so also in this case should be, should be done. Of course, uh, if anybody wants to apply for registration to the European Union, uh, probably it, it, it should provide data on, the, on, on this effect, not only on toxicity and uh, environmental uh, performance uh, of the peptide, uh, also on the non-target effects. Uh, yes. yes. Thank you, Emilio. The next question comes from Katya. 
I was mute. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emilio, for okay. your this uh, excellent talk and for sharing all this information with us. Uh, uh, a quick comment uh, regarding uh, the, the important uh, information that uh, many peptides, although they do not present antimicrobial activity, are able to, uh, to, to trigger inner plant mechanism towards a specific uh, threat. This is uh, very important in my opinion because it catches really our attention that we cannot only look uh, towards antimicrobial uh, activity, mm -hmm. but also yes. to see uh, in, uh, in plant assays uh, uh, behavior uh, of the peptides. My, que my questions, I also noticed that you mentioned uh, that uh, peptides uh, were active and uh, triggered uh, uh, plant response uh, by through topical treatment. And my question uh, is um, if you ever tried different uh, treatment methods and if yes, if you uh, noticed uh, if you noticed the uh, differences uh, in the results between the different treatment methods, and how can this translate into field uh, applications? Yeah, um, well, uh, in, in my view, uh, the most promising peptides are those peptides that are plant defense elicitors uh, for two reasons. One is that the, uh, their profile of, uh, of uh, uh, non-target effects is more reduced than in the case of the, the ones that are antimicrobial, of course. And the, the, the other is that uh, it's a more, uh, in brackets, natural way of protecting the plant because uh, uh, if, you, if you apply them, you are priming the plant. It's a kind of vaccination. And uh, the the concentration, the effective concentrations are notably uh, lower than in the case of the of the antimicrobial ones. Uh, I think it's like in the case of insecticidal peptides, uh, you 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 need uh, rates uh, doses uh, too high uh, to not have uh, side uh, undesired effects, uh, and also because of the cost of, of of the treatment. This is one thing. And the other is that we have uh, we have experience on different uh, ways of application of the treatment in the case of uh, the uh, research uh, that we are doing against Shailella fastidiosa. Uh, in this in this case in this pathogen we have uh, uh, well there are some papers uh, upcoming. One is uh, under revision and another is just. Uh, uh, to be sent to, to the journal, in which we uh, we use a um, um, uh, plant model, which is Nicotiana ventamiana, which is uh, is a plant uh, which is susceptible to Shailella fastidiosa. So it's very easy to work with this plant in the greenhouse. Okay, so we have tested different uh, ways of uh, by endotherapy, by injection, by spraying. And uh, in both cases, it works. There, there is also an almond, and there is an effect. Uh, and the question is that this kind of peptide seems not to be uh, highly toxic for the plant. So you can, you can apply them uh, by injection without producing a, a, a problem uh, into the plant, especially with BP178, this is, this is true, okay? So um, another question is that um, I, I forgot to tell you that uh, to develop symptoms, for example, in olive or almond, with Shailella fastidiosa, you need to uh, wait several months to more than one year, okay? So any experiment with these peptides uh, would take uh, health of the time used in a research project. <laughs> So, so PhD students do not like very well this I one. So we move, yeah, that's the reason for what we move to the uh, Nicotiana Ventamiana uh, as an intermediate uh, proof of concept system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. Thank Thanks. you, Katja. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, the last question uh, comes from Norbert. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the presentation. It was really uh, very interesting and also inspiring. I was just wondering uh, whether you had uh, any information about uh, antibiotic activity of your peptides against uh, human pathogens, because uh, 
then uh, if, if these peptides would also be active against human pathogens, you would have the, the risk of, of developing uh, resistance. Do you have yeah. any information about that? Yes. Yes, uh, when, when we developed it, uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, the first library, which is the, the SecML11 uh, under peptide library, uh, we did uh, also in vitro testing against uh, some of, of uh, human pathogens, but not specifically against the multi-resistant uh, strains, just uh, conventional ones, E. coli, Salmonella, Staphylococcus, uh, Streptococcus, and so on. And uh, we, we, we found that in the library, which is made of 125 uh, peptides, there are some peptides that are active, uh, others not. So when, when, when we screened this library, we found antifungal, antibacterial, and even anti-bacterial uh, uh, involved in, in, in human infections also. But in general, the general trends is that uh, they are less effective against gram-positive bacteria. They are more effective against gram-negative bacteria. But they know that in Portugal, there is a group uh, uh, doing uh, improvement with our, uh, some of our peptides and they succeeded in, in, in increasing the uh, effectiveness against uh, gram-positive human pathogens and uh, probably other. But, well, that's uh, the important thing is that by modification of the sequence and the type of amino acids, you can get uh, all the possible properties of a peptide. You, you can explore uh, multifunctional possibilities, uh, even doing uh, chimeras. Uh, I was not talking about the cyclic synthetic peptides because Lipso Laboratory has developed also a library on that. And, and these peptides are uh, more resistant to proteases. And I don't remember well, but I think that uh, they are also targeting uh, some of these human pathogens. Yeah. But we have concentrated our efforts in plant, uh, in plant pathogens because uh, we cannot uh, 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 work in all the fields. <laughs> that are yeah, yeah. The, the, that, that is clear. I, I fully understand yeah. that. Well, my point was uh, that it would be an advantage uh, of having activity against plant pathogens only because if we uh, generate uh, a high... Uh, Select, uh, selection uh, pressure, then uh, we would have resistance against uh, human pathogens at, at the same time, which is not desirable. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Thanks again to all of the speakers, um, all you. of uh, the attendees asking questions. It was a fantastic symposium, and I'm going to hand over to Katya for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you all for this uh, very exciting uh, event on this specific uh, topic. I would like to, uh, to, to thank again the speakers for accepting the invitation and all the participants uh, to have joined us. And I would like to quickly remember, although Norbert uh, already mentioned it, to quickly, uh, so to quickly remember uh, I, I will try to to share the slides. So to quickly uh, remember um, that there is still time to regis register for the next European uh, Peptide Symposium uh, to be held at Sitch, Barcelona from August 28 to September 2. So early fees registration will end only at the end of March. And I, I, I leave here some uh, slides that the organizer provided to motivate you to go there. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, this in-person meeting will certainly be an ideal occasion for exchanging ideas, creating new uh, collaborations and meet old and make new friends wall while discussing the thriving field of peptide science. I hope to see some of you and to meet some of you there. Uh, and uh, well, from uh, my part, uh, this is it. And thank you again for uh, all of you for this nice participation.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.